morning. Anything else? We've got a little weird mic here. It's always a solemn thing to stand up here and preach the word, and uh, I'm very conscious of that, and uh, never feel really adequately prepared, but it's great to see uh, so many here today. Excited to see you, Ben and Libby. Just by way of introduction, I was uh, baptised in about 1985, and uh, it's actually a decision I've never regretted. And... Uh, as I began to discover early in my Christian experience, I noticed that Jesus uses simple um, analogies from everyday life, uh, you know, from nature mainly, to teach deep spiritual truths. And uh, whenever I found myself sort of stuck, I can't understand something in, in the Bible or in our Christian faith, I've kind of reverted to nature. I've always looked into nature to try and find an explanation, an understanding of those deep spiritual truths. And uh, I've actually become a gardener in the last little while, <laughs> which I never was for a long time. I used to be quite discouraged trying to garden over the years because uh, the bugs always beat me or the Weather always beat me or, you know. But I've uh, since discovered the pleasure of gardening and lots of you know that already. I've been wasting my time for so many years. Very rewarding and very, um, very satisfying. What pleasure there is in the soil. I'm a bit of a late starter. But um, you know, I actually moved to Dargaville, that helped. <laughs> the soil in Dargaville is just amazing and there's lots of sunshine over there, so the sun and clay, you know, we've ended up with the best tomatoes I've ever tasted and the melons I've ever tasted. and So, yeah, welcome to the food from Dargaville. I just wanted to share some lessons I've learned since I became a gardener about spiritual life. I've been, I'm only an amateur, so I'm sure you, many of you have even better lessons that you could teach me, and I'd love to learn them from you. But I just wanted to start off by reading from the great book, Christ Object Lessons. It's uh, one of my favorites, probably my favorite from that great author, Ellen White. Just from the introduction, it's worth reading. In the Savior's parable teaching is an indication of what constitutes the true higher education. Christ might have opened to men the deepest truths of science. He might have unlocked mysteries which have required many centuries of toil and study to penetrate. He might have made suggestions in scientific lines that would have afforded food for thought and stimulus for inventions to the close of time. But he did not do this. He said nothing to gratify curiosity or to satisfy man's ambition by opening doors to worldly greatness. In all his teaching, Christ brought the mind of man in contact with the infinite mind. He did not direct people to study men's theories about God, his word, or his works. He taught them to behold him as manifested in his works, in his word, and by his providences. He didn't want us to study what men say about him. He wanted us to study what he says about himself in the Bible, his word, and in his other book, his world. Christ did not deal in abstract theories but in that which is essential to the development of character, that which will enlarge men's capacity for knowing God and increase his efficiency for doing good. Those are three good things, aren't they? He spoke to men of the truths that relate to the conduct of life that take hold upon eternity. And eternity really should be the subject of our thinking much more than it is. In other words, Jesus wants us to use our brain, right? I loved his uh, way of teaching. Man was created in the beginning and placed in the garden of Eden. His first encounter with God took place there, and unfortunately sin began there also. God cursed the ground because of man's sin in the garden, but he also gave hope 
and a divine promise for restoration right there in the garden. The first promise, wasn't it, in Genesis? And the garden's prominence, prominence didn't end in Eden. Nearly 4,000 years after man's transgression of that holy commandment, Christ knelt in the garden of Gethsemane, agonizing over the will of his Father in heaven and declaring with droplets of blood on his forehead, Father, nevertheless, not my will, but thine. So the garden can be a place of hope, of decision, and as Jesus found out, a place of betrayal. The garden has both good and bad in it, evil and righteousness. Genesis 2.9 In the middle of the garden was the tree of knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and also the tree of life. I've thought about that a lot. Those two trees were side by side. And it illustrates clearly that God's government is based on choice, isn't it? Freedom of choice. He said, don't touch that tree. But he made it so that every time they came to eat from the tree of life, they had to consciously reject the other one. So daily, on a daily experience, they were choosing God. Good lesson for us from the garden. Genesis 3.17 Cursed is the ground because of you, Adam. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Imagine 930 years he lived. 930 years of painful toil to get his food. I wonder how we would have responded to that. Are you grateful you only have a hundred or so of painful toil? But I think the best response is to look each day for the lessons God's teaching us in the toil of life. Some of the lessons I've learned from the garden, if I could put that up on the screen, guys, that'd be great. Thanks, Bill. I'd love your feedback too. I might forget some important things. Weeds are vigorous. <laughs> if you're a gardener, you know this. They don't need any cultivation. They come up strong and healthy in the worst of conditions. They don't even need, seem to need water. And they seem to grow better than all the fruit and veggies you're trying to grow. Sin is very natural, isn't it? It's bad habits. Have you ever tried to teach a kid a bad habit? You don't have to do it. You're constantly trying to get rid of them. Sin is very natural for us. In Psalm 51.5, David believed, he said he believes that he was sinful from birth. Right. In fact, he goes further than that and says he was sinful from his conception. So that's why, isn't it? That's why a child a few hours old, you can see it already, starting to become demanding and uh, selfish. And produce, veggies and fruit, need to be cultivated. And they need regular care. They're just like us, isn't it? Often... Um, Christians are accused of being needing a crutch. Well, I acknowledge that. <laughs> I don't think we're the strongest plants in the garden. Love is a plant, Ellen White says. Love is a plant of heavenly origin, and it must be cultivated. To me, love is the opposite of sin, right? Sin is selfishness. The opposite is love. Lo uh, sin is really the absence of love, isn't it? And the Bible says God is love. Let's read that. First John 4. Right at the back of the Bible. First John 4. Who knows which verses? 7 and 8, isn't it? Dear friends, let us love one another. 
For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So love, all the love that's in this world comes from God. What's another one? Root development is unseen. You know when we plant these cumbers over there, for about a week they look dead. They look like the sun's just destroyed them. Um, but there must be something going on underneath because it doesn't take long. With a bit of care and water, they come to life. So same with our characters, isn't it? You can't always see on the outside what's going on the inside. Your character is the real you. Who you are in private, eh? unseen by everyone else. That's you. That's your character. What's another one? Gardens require a fence, especially if you have chickens or cows or even neighbors. <laughs> Somebody drove into the paddock the other day and stole a whole lot of melons <laughs> straight off the paddock. So boundaries, what kind of fences does the Christian life have? God's boundaries, aren't they? There's ten of them, and they protect us. They protect our character. They protect our family. They protect us. They protect our community. Imagine a world that obeyed God's Ten Commandments. You wouldn't have to lock your car. You wouldn't have to lock your house. And your wife would be safe. There are dangers that need to stay outside. Let's have a look at Galatians 3. Galatians 3.19. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgression until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. See, the fence is only necessary because we live in a sin sinful world. You wouldn't need a fence around your garden if sin didn't exist. And 24, verse 24, so the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we're no longer under the supervision of the law. You know, when you get to the wall, I've met people who say they, in their Christian experience they've come to this wall and they can't get over it. They don't know how to get advance. So they need to walk along the wall. <laughs> it leads us to Christ. But, you know, I've come across people um, who had to shift from where they were to advance to uh, move ahead in their Christian faith. Just like your skin, it's a boundary that protects you. What's another one? Effort is required. Ever try gardening without a spade? They, food, fruit and veggies do not come up by themselves. Very rare. And uh, some effort is required. But you know, our effort is very small, isn't it? We get out there, I've, I've, that's one thing I've been impressed with becoming a gardener, how little we do really. We uh, get the weeds off, dig the dirt a bit, put the seeds in and the little plants, and a lot of it's just waiting. We give it some water, clear the weeds a bit more. God does all the work. God does the big part. God's part is immeasurably great. Our parts are miserably small, but if we don't do our part, God can't do his. Getting dirty is part of gardening and part of real life, isn't it? The Christian life, you're probably going to get dirty. And that's why we need to come to Jesus for a wash. It's a part of character development. We slip, we fall, 
We try things, we get dirty. But praise God, he offers washing. He talks about that a lot. Growing has a season. The time is limited, isn't it? Especially where I live. We uh, come from mud when you can't get on the paddock until about three months later it turns to stone and you can't dig it. <laughs> You've got a little window to do all your gardening. And uh, Christian life is the same, isn't it? Time is linear. There's an end to it. And Jesus said that when the gospel's preached to all the world, the end will come. So we're living in probation time. So don't believe Darwin, you know, when he says you've got millions of years. You haven't. Time is short. And prophecy, understanding prophecy, shows you that we're right at the end. The outskirts are dangerous. I don't know if you notice this. You notice it when you're market gardening like I am. Those plants on the ends of the rows are the ones that get run over. Because that's where the tractors turn. And they're the ones that where the boots walk, you know. So I recommend uh, getting right in there. Full commitment. <laughs> deep in the garden. Deep inside the faith. Helps you enjoy it. And you know, even veggies growing in the wrong place are actually weeds. If a potato comes up where you don't want it, you dig it up and throw it away, don't you? We do have to get into the right place. And I, that's why I think finding God's church is important. He operates in the church, doesn't he? The Holy Spirit, it says, was given for the church. And that's where God operates. So if you can find God's true church you'll find the truth. It works both ways, doesn't it? If you study the truth, you'll find God's church. But if you find God's church, you'll find the truth. And you'll find his family. And you'll find his vineyard where he wants you to work. So just some... It's not going to work now. Some quick... Um, other things I thought of. Fertilizer can help. But the best fertilizer is what? Water. <laughs> water is the best fertilizer. And what's the water? The water of life, Jesus said, you know, our relationship with him, isn't it? Walking with him every day. And you'll never thirst, he said. The sun gives light and warmth, and they're absolutely vital. Sharp tools are safer than blunt. And sharp tools, when it comes to the Christian life, is what? God's Word is very sharp, it says. It cuts right through to separating thoughts and feelings, bone and marrow. You know, isn't that what we need? We need not to pretend. We need to. We need God to look right inside and dig out the things that aren't right. We need to remove weeds by their roots. You know, I've been all through that, cutting weeds off on top. They come up again. And what's another one? Example I had from our home in Rawani. The longer you leave them, the harder it gets. <laughs> so deal with those bad habits, you know. Let Jesus take those bad habits when you're young. But weeds make good compost. Those bad things, those weaknesses, can become strengths. And they'll nourish your experience if you let them. And you'll be able to help other people who are struggling with the same problems. And my last one I put on, the last two, no substitute for experience. Um, old gardeners know the best way to grow things. And uh, I'm just an amateur, but uh, I'm learning a lot. And lots of you could teach me better lessons than this. But Christianity only becomes real by experience, doesn't it? 
We can talk about it, we can read about it, but you're not going to find out it works unless you experience it. And the other thing I put down was regular care. A little bit every day makes your garden grow very well. If you leave it, it ends up a big job. And isn't that right with the Christian walk? A little bit every day. A little bit of study, a little bit of prayer makes a huge difference. And it changes your character. Love is a plant of heavenly origin. I love that statement. Yeah, my other favorite statement from God's word is, God is love. That is a huge statement. And I think we'll be studying it for eternity. <laughs> but it's an amazing statement. God, you know, gardening seems boring. It used to to me, not so long ago. <laughs> but now I've found it's one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. It's interesting. I, um, there's a lot of satisfaction in it. And um, just about every day I get home from work and go in the garden, don't I? Because it's so much fun, I just seem to enjoy it. And, you know, in modern times, marriage is seen as boring, isn't it? It's portrayed that way. But, you know, you ask anyone who's been married for a long time in a, in a happy marriage, there's nothing more rewarding. There's no relationship as rewarding as a good marriage. Church is commonly portrayed as boring. But ask any committed Christian, there's no more satisfying experience than being in the faith, right? But to young, so really I'm talking to young people. I mean, some of you already made that commitment, but I'm, I'm saying from experience. I looked at the world, looked at the church, and I thought, the church is boring, the world's fun. <laughs> but I, I was deceived by it. It's like the best girls seem to like the worst boys, right? Why is that? Why do good girls love bad boys? It's because mate, the weeds look very vigorous, don't they? They look tough. They don't care. They're in charge, you know. It's always amazed me, but... Just, uh, you can learn these lessons from the garden. So, what I like to say in closing is, you know, if you've never made the decision to be a Christian, today's the day of salvation. As Moses said in Deuteronomy 31, let's have a look. Deuteronomy 31. Verses 19 and 20. Get the right chapter. Look at this. I found this with a computer. That's tricky. You know the words he said, I set before you life and death. Didn't he say that? Today choose life. Choose, choose following God as against death. Choose life. Lovely to see our new baby at the back there, Leela. <laughs> new life. Jesus offers to give us new life. And if we fall for the world's lies, we'll think it's boring. But God offers us happiness. It's all he offers us. And uh, that's what I'd like to encourage you with today. Choose life. Amen. Our last hymn. This is my father's world and I hope... As you, as you go through this week and look at your garden and look at your experiences of work, 
that you'll be able to learn lessons about your faith that'll grow you, help you, help you to grow. This is my Father's world. It's, yes, Lord, we do want you to be king and uh, we want to be subject to you this week and this, the rest of our lives. Thank you for the simple examples you give in everyday life that teach us how to be a Christian. Please make us a blessing to the people that we live with, the people that we associate with, and may your work be finished soon that we can enjoy a world without sin. Please bless everyone who came today. May your word be planted deep in their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.